Hi, my name is Jonathan Wardrip, and uh, this is my fish room that we're in here. Um, I've been keeping fish my whole life, and uh, after college and in the last four or five years, have gotten more into it. Um, you know, it started with one 20 gallon tank growing up and has uh, progressed into now about 2,200 gallons in this room. So, um, yeah, with that, I think we can get into it. You'll, in this uh, tour, you'll see um, some large South American cichlids and uh, lots of Southeast Asian and Indo-Pacific fish, um, some Tanganyikan cichlids, and there's probably some other stuff in here too. So, um, with that, this is a domestic discus tank, um, and, and uh, there are also green phantom plecos. Um, these are Bolivian rams as well, and then some stir by quarries. Uh, and I keep this tank at about 85 degrees year round. Um, this is one of the only heated tanks in the room. For the most part, I, I just heat the airspace. The tap water here in Sacramento, thankfully, is uh, really soft almost year round. In the late summer, it can get harder. Uh, so there is uh, an RO line running to this tank. Um, but for the most part, I'm able to keep them in our tap here at around 60 to 70 TDS. Um, then below them, we have the green terror. And I have other s tanks with large South American cichlids, but find that he does not get along with them. And uh, I like to say that this is his fish room. We're in his space right now. That's why he's coming up and attacking the, the glass. Um, these claim territory well beyond the limits of the tank. Um, and then over here in this tank by herself is uh, a Central American cichlid, um, an Argentia cichlid. And I'd like to get her mate eventually. Up here we have some peacock bass. These are uh, mostly mono peacocks, the three larger ones. The smaller one is in Ocellaris. Um, and then I have a few more small peacock bass that will eventually join them in here. Um, and the plant die off is because I recently overcame an ick outbreak in the tank um, and salted the tank heavily and it killed the ick, but it also killed many of the plants. They're, they're coming back, but um, it was a nice lush green carpet a couple weeks ago. <laughs> um, down beneath our frontosa, um, I think these are typically called six stripe frontosa. Uh, and yeah, with the soft tap water we have here in Sacramento, I do have to dose uh, fairly heavily to keep uh, the water nice and hard for them because Lake Tanganyika has high pH, hard water. Um, and then just quickly, so almost all of my tanks are run on sumps. Um, I like the versatility that they offer. I like the extra water volume. Um, my motto in fish keeping for the most part is fewer, larger tanks. Um, and I actually run most of the sumps off of canister filters for a little extra filtration. Um, and they have built in pumps and I have canister filters sitting around. So um, these bottom tanks down here are running on over tank sumps, which are really, really nice. You don't run into the same potential flooding issues that you do with, uh, with normal 
examples. Um, yeah. Then this up here, these are pretty much all Southeast Asian, um, Thailand, Borneo, Sumatra, um, fish. Uh, so lots of different types of barbs, um, rose lines. Well, I guess really only two types of barbs at this point, rose lines and black ruby barbs. Um, and then I have some pearl garamis and um, freshwater clouded archers. And then beneath them, uh, the focus of the tank is mostly rainbows. This has kind of become a catch-all tank, uh, but I have, since I know we have some rainbow people in the club, um, I have Glossolepis incisus, uh, Chilorthina alani wapoga, and then um, linking on the name, another uh, Amela natania rubivitata, also from the Wapoga River. Um, and I have actually been able to breed the rubivitata. Melanotania uh, successfully. Um, actually, all the fish you see in here are, are were bred uh, in this room. And uh, there are some other little loaches and uh, some twig catfish in there. Uh, and then this is a 600 gallon tank um, that in total is on an 800 gallon system. There's a, a big sump that probably has about 50 gallons of water in it. And then two refugiums. One is probably about a hundred gallons and the other is uh, a 125. Um, and almost all the fish you see in here are again, Southeast Asian in the Pacific area. Um, the arowana is Scleropages jardini. Scleropages formosa is not legal in the U.S. That's the Asian arowana. Um, if we were matching biomes, that one would, would fit in a little bit better. Um, and then the catfish you see are uh, a synodontis and they're African and they will eventually go in with the, the Frontosa that we saw earlier, but, um, they're a little bit big for that for now. So yeah, in this tank, uh, we have tinfoil barbs and, um, some Ruby scats. And these are green chromides. Uh, this is a giant garami. Uh, the one silverfish that looks a little bit different, you might see some bruising on, is um, a, a moss ear. It's Torduronensis. It will get quite a bit bigger. Um, we'll probably get almost the size of the arowana. And uh, I like how the scales look similar to, to arowana scales. Um, and then I have a group of clown loaches in here. Um, and a royal clown knife. And she has a little bit of a, a misshapen head here, but um, she's a lot of fun. And uh, the then I have a regular clown knife too, and he's hiding in the back at the moment. Um, and then my favorite fish uh, in the world, and I can't really explain why, uh, but is our datinoids. And um, so I have a group of them in here. There are five of them there, and I think there are a couple more scattered around the tank. Um, 
These are the darker brown ones with the brown stripes? Correct, yeah. That are all just kind of hiding and doing nothing. So again, I can't really explain why I like them so much. <laughs> they're not very exciting, but they're big predatory fish. Um, they're incredibly endangered. The uh, They're in their natural habitat. Um, the rivers are being destroyed by palm oil plantations. Um, they have not been bred in captivity in anywhere other than Thailand. Um, and they definitely are using hormones to, to pull that off. Uh, it would be fun to do eventually, but I don't know that I have the space. Apparently they like really deep water for breeding. So, um, something I've thought about, but, uh, yeah. So these are all endodatinoids. There are several types. Um, there are also Siamese tigers, um, which are completely extinct in the wild and very difficult to get in the hobby. Um, there are New Guinea tigers that are brackish to marine. Um, and then uh, American tigers or silver tigers, which are uh, also brackish to, to marine. Um, oh, and then uh, North Thailand tigers, um, which look similar to these, but have narrower narrower bars. Um, this down here is the refugium for the tank. I have a couple breeding pairs of Crebenzis and these are some leftover fry from those. Um, I also have a group of endlers in here. Um, the point is to have lots of plants growing in here all the time. So I like that I have duckweed in here. I get to clean it out every couple of weeks and know that I've pulled lots of nitrates out. Um, and I really enjoy having the full ecosystem. So most of my tanks have many, many of my tanks have plants. Almost all of my tanks have snails. Um, yeah, I, wa I like watching all the life that would live together naturally continue to do that um, in microcosms. So coming around here, this tank down here is also on the same 800 gallon system. Um, these are some more small clown loaches that are still snack sized for a lot of the bigger predatory fish in the tank above and other mossier. Um, and then down in this pipe, down way at the bottom, there is uh, a little catfish that will get a bit bigger. Um, and that's Bigroides melapterus. Hopefully we can uh, get a picture of it, we'll see. Um, moving on, this is a 300 gallon South American community, um, cichlids and catfish and uh, red hook silver dollars, a couple of grow out um, peacock bass that are too small to go in with the big ones for now. Um, I've got a couple of uh, dwarf pike cichlids that I got from the SAS auction. There are definitely some auction fish in this fish room, so thank you to those of you who bring, bring fish to that. Then from there, I've got a couple fish in quarantine, recovering, don't want to stress them out. Um, then in here, in this little tank, there's a, a baby peacock bass that's growing out. Up here, this is a uh, Neolamprologus multipunctatus. We've got a breeding group of them going. They're a lot of fun. I like uh, watching them rescape the tank and, and move around the sand. Um, and this tank, has a couple more grow out of the 
Ruby Batata Rainbows, uh, and then some young L129 Colombian Zebra Plecos. Um, this tank here is a breeding group of uh, Protomelis Steveni uh, Taiwan Reef. These are Malawan cichlids. These were purchased at the SAS auction as well, and they're super shy, so the male is uh, running away. And then down at the bottom here, I've got, uh, these are all grow outs to eventually go in the 300 gallon South American community. Um, so these are Waru, um, Geophagus abelio, and uh, some more Pictus cats. Uh, and then this last tank with fish up here is um, Neolamprologus catapunctatus. This is another dwarf Tanganyikan shell dweller. Um, it is also a lot of fun to, to keep and watch and watch them breed and watch the colony grow. Um, and then I also keep a lot of shrimp. Um, Shrimp started out for me as a way to recoup some of the costs of fish keeping. It costs a lot of money, as we all know, to keep fish. And um, shrimp seemed like a pretty straightforward way to make some of that back. Um, and then I should have known better because I got addicted to shrimp as well. So um, they still definitely help pay for the hobby, but they also cost a lot. <laughs> Uh, so in this tank up here, these are uh, Caradina. One of the fun things about Caradina and specifically Taiwan bees is that you can mix them because they will breed true. So if you have a, a blue bolt breed with a, a black panda, then you'll get blue bolts and black pandas. Um, and if you have a black King Kong breed with, with a red King Kong, then you'll get black King Kongs and red King Kongs. So um, it's a fun genetic project to, uh, to observe. Um, fun to watch them all come out and fun when you have a buried shrimp to wonder which type types you'll be getting out. Um, and then my favorite shrimp are down here. These are fancy red tigers. Uh, and the thing I like about tigers in particular is that they can live well and th thrive and breed in both Caridina and neo Caridina parameters. Um, and for those who don't know, Caridina like very uh, relatively soft um, and slightly acidic water and neos at this point don't really care, but generally like a higher pH um, and, and a little bit harder of water. Um, so the caridinas have buffering substrate and then are, are on RO water. Uh, and then pretty much everything else is, is on tap. So I also have these are just Blue Dream neo -caridina. These are the bread and butter. These are what have actually pretty much paid for the rest of the shrimp rack. Um, these are some uh, fancy black tigers that I will... Uh, the colony should be going soon, hopefully. And then if we come down, these are red neo caridina um, these are a mixed grade from uh, i think it's usually called sakura to fire red then there are uh, oranges in the tank next to them but they're pretty hard to see so we can kind of skip over them and then um, these are bloody mary which is a, a high grade red shrimp Um, down here at the end, we've got, these are 
orange-eyed blue tigers. And then next to them uh, are some green neocaridina. Um, and then I think when Eric asked me uh, about writing a bio for, for doing this tour um, and had me think about what my specialties were, um, I said adenoids, shrimp, and automation. <laughs> so uh, I love automation and when I was, when we were moving into this house and I was building out the fish room, I knew I wanted everything to be as automatic as possible. Um, I think it's easy for all of us to get burned out on water changes. And um, so I put together this auto water change system. So there's a line coming in from outside controlled by this shutoff valve. And it goes through this whole house carbon block filter. I have a, a one micron filter in there at the moment. Um, and then goes into this garbage can. Um, and this garbage can has a, actually a toilet fill um, mechanism, device, whatever you want to call it. That, and, and a pump, and as the pump pumps out water, the toilet fill will allow water back in. Um, and then I do heat the water up to about 75 degrees. Um, I find that that's warm enough that in the winter uh, I don't get as much condensation forming and, and mold growing <laughs> on my pipes. So actually all the tanks we saw today are on a drip line. I referenced it a few times. Um, the drip line runs around the room and uh, into the tanks. I use Gemco um, drippers and they make a, a specific uh, thread cutter that attaches to any drill. Um, it's actually really easy and really straightforward. Uh, and I, an overflow system, right? Yeah, and so then all the tanks overflow. Um, and actually, th so this garage is not plumbed at all. Um, so the, the water line that comes in, actually, I attach to the sprinkler line before the sprinklers. And then uh, the water goes out and I have a couple of tubs outside um, that maybe we can get a picture of or something. Uh, and then we water the grass in the backyard and we have a vegetable garden that we water with, the, with it as well. Um, and so the fish are all constantly getting new water. Um, Do you have a specific like percentage that you try to aim for? Or so I th or? it's, it's about 10% a day, uh, I would say. So, um, and that, that isn't necessarily true for all the tanks. For example, the Tanganyikan tanks, I would change a little bit less water so that I don't have to just constantly be dosing uh, all the time. And then like the 600 gallon, we call it a drip line, but it's flowing out. Um, and the discus get more than 10% a day. The discus are probably getting 30 to 40% a day and they're in a 75. Um, and I'm trying to think, uh, then, so getting discus and having a couple months a year with hard water here. And then also having the shrimp, I realized I needed RO. Um, so I have an RO system that is on uh, a smart sprinkler and um, with a manifold here. And it, 
the RO comes in here and the waste line just goes into the trash can and then I have a RO that I can run to my fish and shrimp that need it. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming along for the tour. Thank you for uh, bearing with us. Um, I should have mentioned at the beginning, but I'm on the board of the Sacramento Aquarium Society. Um, we've really appreciated the participation so far with these online meetings and um, have enjoyed getting to see uh, other people's fish rooms and, and we'll enjoy continuing to get to see them as we go forward. Um, and thank you very much to Michael for making this all happen. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the questions.